Welcome to a new episode of On Spot Review. I know I've not done one in so long, uh, but I figure I should get back into doing On Spot Reviews, and what better way than to talk about The Last of Us Part 2. Uh, by the way, if you hear a, 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 a noise in the background, that's the fan. I had to turn it on. It's really hot. It's like, what, um, 92 degrees. It's all good, but... Let's talk about The Last of Us Part 2. There's stuff I want to talk about that's spoiler heavy, so uh, there will be spoilers in this video, so you've been warned. Okay, so if you don't be spoiled, you know what to do. But there will be spoilers. You've been warned. So, I kind of went in to The Last of Us 2 with, like, really low expectations. You know, I know there was a lot of, like, uproar. A lot of people were, were just already ready to hit the game, which is... Fine, I'm not going to talk about people's opinions in this video, but I want to talk about my experience with the game because there was stuff in Last of Us 2 that I generally liked. I think there is stuff in this game that's really good, that's done very well, and is just weighed down by all these bad decisions within the game that kind of made it feel confusing a little bit. Time, a little bit. Like, it was such a mess overall that I can't really fault people for not liking the game, etc., so, like, you know, you look at Death Stranding, that game is very polarizing, it's very divisive, but it's fascinating. You know, the divisiveness of it is very fascinating and it's unique. You know, I love movies, shows, games, what have you, that are very divisive and polarizing. I love when people watch something and they either have a huge love for it or a huge hate for it. It's always interesting to see, you know, what what's going on with this. You know, it's, it's something that's so, like, starking. Like, that that just strikes people immediately. Like, you look at Death Stranding, and so many people have their own opinion on, on what that game is, if they love it or they hate it. It's so, so fascinating with that, because it's such a unique style. While The Last of Us, too, is divisive, not because of anything that's fascinating or or um, or weak to the game. It's... it's polarizing for the story beat that it that it's doing like oh yeah this is a story so like you get why it's divisive but it's nothing that's like interesting it's not like oh wow they did something that's completely new and unoriginal like unoriginal i mean original like this is something completely original and, and unique where it's like yeah it's polarizing for all these things that you know is now fundamentally interesting like it, it's such a conceptual level of of fascinating Fascinating, fascin that's fascinating with it. There's something conceptual about that. While Last of Us 2 just is like, yeah, okay, I, I get why people don't like it. Whatever. There, there's stuff in the game that, that is very obvious why people will be pissed off with with how they did the Last of Us 2. So I get that, and that's why it's not that that's why the pull you know the divisiveness with it isn't that interesting to me. It's like, okay, yeah. Uh, but I want to get started with the gameplay, because the story, I have a lot to say about that, so let's just focus on the gameplay for now. The gameplay is exactly what you expect from the first game, you know? And that's kind of like, for me, when people say that, like, oh yeah, this gameplay is just like the first one, it's kind of... It's kind of silly, because a lot of games do that. A lot of sequels play nearly identical, with some small improvements from the first game. So I, I can't really say that Last of Us 2 is the only offender of that. So many games do that too, so it's not really unique to Last of Us 2 to, to have the game play so closely to the first one. But where I draw the issue with the gameplay of, of 2 is that the AI feels so sporadic and random. Like, the infected AI seems very competent, it, it does a good job swarming you, having you think on your feet, having you just keep constantly moving, 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 where if you blow your cover with the infected, you're gonna be swarmed immediately, where you could have, like, you know, the walkers, then you'll have, like, I think they're called the rattlers, I don't remember the, the, the names for some of the, for the new enemy types, and they're, like, the screamers, the, sque the screamers, I don't fucking know, the big, the big ones that, that yell a lot. Not not the uh, bloaters, but like the whatever the, the other ones are. Um, like those guys can rush you in. You have clickers coming at you as well. So like the infected does a good job uh, overpowering you and kind of forcing you to keep moving and using what you can to fend them off, which I loved. I love that stuff with the infected. The infected is probably the best part of the gameplay of it. 
the human AI seems so random and sporadic where it's like, I don't know what, what the fuck happened with them. Because it seemed these, like, uh, in one of the streams I did, I, I don't know which one it was, but I was in this, in this tower, in this building, and I was Abby in this, in this part of the game. And I was going around, and in some cases I was kind of blowing my cover by accident, so I had to fight some enemies off. I would run back to this one area that I would assume would be safe, and then it would be, because then they would just kind of lose my lose uh, where I was, and just kind of go about their business. And then I could kind of go back to stealth killing them one by one, little, little by little, while I did kind of blow my cover a few times, I did have to go through a firefight in there as well. So during this firefight, I killed off a good portion of them where there's only one enemy left. I'm shooting at him, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to just go down because I have to reload. I, I have to craft some stuff. I have to go through all my weapons see what I have in case I miss or whatever. So as I'm doing that, he's walking towards me. And I'm like, oh shit, he's going to come up after me? Do I have a, a melee weapon? He comes to like, I'm right here. There's like a, a, a um, cover right here. He's right here. He comes here, stops, and says, lost sight of the enemy. And I was just sitting there, I was like, dude, you know I'm behind the cover. You know I'm there. All that he had to do was kind of walk around. Didn't walk around, stood there, I was like, oh, well, lost, lost, lost track. And then turned around and walked back, and I was like, okay. And then I did a self-kill. There's so many instances with the human AI that... I feel like I should have been getting away with a lot of the shit I've I've been doing, because it, it's like this is th this stuff would would get me killed in like Metal Gear Metal Gear Solid Five, one through th one through five pretty much, even in, in Super Mario sixty four like you know the AI there at least like you know you know that there's a leash with that AI in Mario sixty four but you know they do a good job chasing you well with fucking. These human AI in Last of Us 2, it's like, they don't know how to tie their own shoes. It's so weird. And then they introduce dogs, which is like, okay, this is an interesting uh, thing to introduce, where these dogs will force you to kind of leave cover because they will follow your odor, they will find, find where you are in cover and sniff you out. And they and they will blow your cover easily, where you have to keep moving, keep thinking on your feet, which is really cool. Like, it's, like the, the dogs add so much to, to the game. But today, when I beat it, I was in Santa Barbara, they had the dogs there, and they were non-existent. Like, I, I was in this firefight, I accidentally uh, stayed out of cover too long. They're like, oh, there she is, and they all try to swarm me, and all of a sudden a dog spawns. I was like, oh shit, there's a dog here? I didn't know. And then, like, I go around a corner, and then they lose track of me, and the dog kind of just doesn't do anything. Like, I'm sitting there like... In the beginning of the game, the dog would, like, sniff me out. Like, the dog would have found me by now. And now I'm, like, at the end of the game, the dog just kind of gives up. Like, it's like the dog forgot that it's a dog and it can do shit. Like, it was so weird. Like, it really made me wonder, were the human AI the last thing they did for the game? Like, it just didn't feel consistent. Like, the, the uh, infected felt consistent, like, from start to finish. Like, the infected had a consistent pattern where you know it, hey if I get caught I'm fucked with the humans it's like you don't know if you're gonna get like the A team or you're gonna get the the glue sniffers like it was so random where it was like I didn't feel that um pressured half the time and some of the stuff I was like you know there'd be times where I was like completely at a disadvantage and I came out on top and I was like what like there's there was this one enemy I had no ammo I didn't have a melee weapon. When you don't have a melee weapon, it's very hard to kill an enemy by your bare hands because you have to kind of beat them a lot. So I was being, I was, I was forced to punch one enemy down, like constantly having to punch, dodge, whatever. Well, this guy with a shotgun was literally just watching this happen, and he was just like, and then I beat his friend, and the guy ran away, and I was like. This guy had a shotgun, and he does. And as I'm like preoccupied with this one person, he doesn't shoot me. Like in the beginning of the game, I couldn't fucking do that because if I did that, the other enemy would shoot me. So it was so weird that I felt like that. I feel like maybe halfway into the game, the the human AI must have been the last thing they added to the game because they were just. It was really embarrassing to see 
what you could get away with, how much you could kind of do, and not get punished for it. Like, any other game, if I was punching one enemy, and the other guy had a gun, I would have gotten a game over, and it was so weird. While the infected, it was like, I can't fuck around when the infected are around. And it was just like, like, what? At this, at that point, I was like saying to myself, you know, this game should have just been about the infected at this point, because that would have been more tense than these human AI that were just so dumb. Like, it was so weird. Like, the beginning, they were, like, at least semi-competent. Now, well, like, when you get, like, halfway through, it's like, they don't know how to get out of a paper bag, almost. Uh, the other thing that was really disappointing was, in the, in the Left Behind DLC, they allowed you to kind of throw clickers at enemies. Like, they kind of allowed you to pit enemies against each other. Like, oh, there's clickers in this room? Oh, there's there's people looking for me over there. Oh, I know, I'm going to do it. You just start, throw, start throwing bottles to where they are so the clickers could get to them. And it was like, it was really cool. It was a really nice addition to the first game that doesn't play in the main game, but, you know, it worked out in the DLC. And I was thinking to myself, if they did it at that time, dude, if they did a sequel... They're gonna have more of that, and I played this. I played the second game, and there wasn't any of it. There was like maybe two instances where you could kind of pit the enemies against each other, but in those instances, it felt scripted. Honestly, like it just didn't feel like it was genuine. Like you were going through, I think, a subway, and it was like red and all stuff, and they introduced like the the new big big boy enemies and the the squeamers, whatever. And at that point, it was like, they're, they're already pitted against each other, and you didn't really have to do anything, and you could get around. And I was just like, this isn't really fun. Left Behind did it so much better, where you could just kind of throw balls and be a dick about it. Here, it's like, the game does it for you, and it's like, I don't know. There might have been like one instance or two instances where you could do that, but it's like, you know... What's, you know, who really cares about it, you know? Uh, it's just really weird that they didn't capitalize on what they introduced in Left Behind. It was just so lame. Uh, the boss fights are what I expected. Like, they're, they're, they were either just gauntlets that, that would replace boss fights, like the first game. Uh, but there was this one enemy that was really rad. Uh, and this part was, like, one of my favorite parts of the game. You go to the hospital to get medical equipment for Yara. And I loved, I loved the hospital you're in, that it was like the ground zero of the of the infection. Like, this is where it began. And I was like, that's really fucking cool that, like, you, you go to the place where it all began. I was like, wow, this is really rad. I really, like, love what this is, because then you can explore what people thought at that time. You know, whatever. I love that. You go down to the basement where they're like, hey, we don't know what the fuck's down there. You know, that that has been there since the beginning of this. So, you know, it's it's crazy down there. And, it's just, and, and I was just like, oh, shit. You go down there, there's all these clickers. And it, it, was, it was so fucking cool. They introduced this new boss fight where it's this gigantic fungal monster. And you, you shoot a while, you know, whatever, like in any boss fight. And then it's split into two, and you're just like, oh shit, there's two of them now? There's one that's fast, one that's slow? It's, it was really cool. It was a really cool boss fight. And they never really top it. And that's really, really sad that, like, we won't get stuff like that before, but it's had a really cool design. I really love that part of the game, and, and it, nothing really topped it after that. Uh, so that's kind of my my opinion on the gameplay. The combat is fun. I like the prone, I love crawling around, I love the sneaking, I loved the looting, all that shit was really, like, fun and satisfying. It was just the AI just felt so random where it's either a team of competent humans or glue sniffers or just good infected. You know, it, was, it wasn't anything that was, um, uh, really made you worry as much as I did in the first game. Like, the first game... Every human AI, I was like, oh shit, I have to like really be careful. And it, and it felt like you really had to try to get around them. Once you, once you break the, uh, the, sneaking, the sneaking mode, you know, you're fucked. You're done. And I know they tried to introduce like a caution phase, which has been in Metal Gear for, for ages, but 
the caution phase in this is so laughable that it's like, it's just like you might as well just not ha not have it. Like, it, it just doesn't seem to work the way that it, it that they thought it would. It, it felt like. So I can't really say that this these new mechanics that they introduced were interesting. The other thing I want to touch on is this is a little side note. Uh, it didn't really affect my the game for me as much, but I think the PR for this game was was terrible. I think the way they marketed it was awful. The way that they described it was just bad. And I don't I don't blame the developer. I don't blame Naughty Dog for this because you know a lot of times when you're when you're trying to market your game, it's always someone that doesn't even work on the game or maybe someone that's just like trying to really go off with these generalities or whatever. And one thing that they were saying was like in the in, in the PR campaign was oh you're gonna feel real bad about killing enemies, man. And, and it's like I don't think that's a good marketing point because it's nice detail. Like I think if they didn't if they didn't mention it at all, people would just say, "Hey, that's nice detail that to have enemies kind of like cry out for uh, other enemies. Like you kill you kill one human and they might scream out, "Oh my God, Mike! Oh my God, Hannah!" All that kind of stuff. That's kind of cool. Like, it's a nice detail. But the way they marketed it was, like, something that was, like, bigger and grandiose than it was. And it was just like, what are we doing? I mean, this is just, like, a, a detailed thing. It's like them, like, highlighting, guys, when you play Last of Us 2, there's going to be cans with a logo on it. And it's like, okay. So I, I, I think the marketing with, with the enemy AI responding to their dead bodies is, like, Dumb marketing. It's really dumb marketing. I don't. I. I. I think that's honestly all on the marketing side of, of trying to hype that up. Um, and the thing with the dogs, like they try to also do the same thing with the dogs, and it's like, yeah. I mean, the thing is that it's really hard for me to feel bad for enemies that are out to kill me, which is like whatever. You know, as I said, if they just didn't mention it, if they just didn't talk about it, it would be like a cool little detail to to the game. But they made it such a big deal, and it's like. These are enemies that are trying to kill you. Like the dog is trying to kill you. The dog is sniffing you out, snitching on you, and you're, and the dog's killing you. Like, do you really want? I mean, are you really gonna feel bad in that context? Like, Metal Gear Solid Three does doesn't like shame you for anything. Like, yeah, I could say that. Oh well, in MGS Three, you have to go through like the the river of all the people you killed, but they don't really do that for dogs. Like, if you kill a dog in MGS Three, it's not gonna show up in the um in that boss fight of the sorrow, but, uh, you know, they, they, they don't mention it because it's not, a, it's not a big deal, like, it's not a big design deal of the game, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, th this happens, and, like, that's why people liked about MGS3's, uh, the sorrow boss fight, is that <clears throat> it wasn't marketed, and it was, like, people got to experience it, and it was like, whoa, this is, like, a really cool detail that it actually, like, uh, counts for all the stuff you did in the game. While in Last of Us 2, it's just like they made the PR made it such a big deal that they would scream out the uh, dog's name, the other people's name, and it's like these things are trying to kill me. You know, it, it's a nice detail, I'll give it that, and that's really all it is. It's just detail. Um, so you know, there's all the people, there's also like people are saying that oh, the game forces you to kill a dog, they kill you, they force you to kill the enemies, uh, to be honest, because. You can't open certain doors because it makes a lot of noise, so the enemies will all, like, swarm you. So, you know, the game encourages you to kill all the enemies. It doesn't give you the option. So you have to kill the dog, you have to kill the human enemies, you have to kill everyone in that game. And I, I think this illusion of choice mechanic <laughs> that's in this game feels so dated. It's like, oh, you have to kill all the enemies before you go on to the next, to the next part of the game. It feels so, like... Arbitrary and archaic, you know, like, it's it's funny, if you watch a lot of my other DSP content, I make fun of DSP for, like, in Halo 5, where he just kind of runs past enemies and he goes on, and it's like, you know, Halo 5 is a first-person shooter, it's an action game, so that allows you to kind of go in and, and you know, just kill all the enemies, and that, and that design choice is fine, because it's an action game. But The Last of Us is a survival game. It's a game that's supposed to reward survival and, you know, not... And sometimes picking stuff that might be the hardest, that might have the bigger payoff. While Last of Us 2 just kind of tells you, no, you have to do it this way, you have to do that, you have to do this, so you get to move on. And even to a degree, the first game did that too. 
And it's like, I, I feel like that we can move past this mechanic and the design of forcing the gamer to do stuff. Because in Last of Us 2, like, it should be rewarding players for choosing not to go to do uh, combat. You know, and, and you could argue, well, this isn't a big issue to the game, but it's just, it's like, it, it's it's the biggest misopportunity in that game because fucking Resident Evil has done that since the PS1 era. Like, you could go through that game without killing a single enemy. The only time that the game kind of encourages it is if you're trying to go to a safe room or you're fighting a boss. Otherwise, you could kind of go through the game and not kill anyone. Like, in the in the first game, if you open the front door, a dog will walk in. You can keep that dog in the foyer all throughout the whole game. You don't have to kill it. While in Last of Us 2, it's like, yeah, well, you, you have to kill it because this thing you're going to be moving is going to make a lot of noise. And it's like, the game should have been rewarding these more risky challenges. Like, they could have had, like, this exit as a, hey, this is, like, an easy exit. You could just kind of move it over, but you have to kill all the enemies. Or there's a trickier exit that you can still progress to, but you ha you, but you know you have to kind of get there by sneaking and, and all that kind of shit. So it should give you that kind of option. It would have worked. But uh, they kind of stick with this old design habit. The only time the game kind of gives you the option of killing enemies is really with the infected, which is such a weird design choice if you think about it. Like, they give you the choice to kill the infected, but they don't give you that choice for the human AI, for the most part. Like, there may have been, like, one or two situations in the game in total that I didn't have to kill the human AI, but overall, the game does force you to kill the human AI, but the infected, for the most part, you kind of could go through without killing them, which is such a weird thing. So, that is my major complaints and opinions with the game with the gameplay. It's it's still overall fun, but there's this stuff in it that can be fine tuned a little bit more. Uh, so it's it's all it's all right. It's good. It's solid for what it does. It's it's fun. Uh, <clears throat> now let's get to the meat and potatoes of this video. The story. The story, the story, the story is such a weird situation for me because you have this this revenge plot that kind of ends with this message of, you know, non-violence or like, you know, revenge doesn't solve anything, whatever. You know, you have this, this, uh, this, this underlying theme of, of violence begets violence, which is fine. You know, the revenge plot could have worked. My issue with it is actually let's, let's start with the beginning of it, okay? Before we get to my major gripes with the revenge plot, the pacing is so n nonsensical. Even with the gameplay, the gameplay pacing is is nonsense too. Like the the balance, of, like the pacing of enemy waves and story stuff is so random and all over the place. And not all over the place. Not random. I take that back. It's 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 this kind of like pattern that you kind of start noticing in like this game and God of War. Okay, combat. All right, story. All right, walk. All right, combat. And it's like, okay. And then there'll be other times where it might be combat, combat, combat. A little bit of story, then then walking for nonsense. And it's like I I don't know, but uh, the story pacing is just it was just really weird uh, because if. The first game, the, the, there, there's been a huge gap between the release of the first game and the second and the second game. A huge gap, and usually when you start the second game, <clears throat> you want to get your bearings. You want to remember stuff with the game and the cast. And with MGS Five, you just include Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain together. MGS Two with the tanker and the plants. They do a good job at getting you familiar with the characters, the backstory, where they were, what happened, etc. They give you a good chunk of time to really get accustomed to everything. You know, with MGS2, like, yeah, okay, we're, we're coming from MGS1. Years later, you're, you're playing MGS2. All right, here's Snake. Remember Otacon? Oh, right, there's Otacon. All right, Snake got Snake around. He has cigarettes. Oh, he has this and that. And it kind of gives you this, like, th this kind of way to to remember Snake and remember where he was in the first game, 
all this stuff. So you get accustomed to to Snake before they do the switch in the plant chapter, where it's like, okay, now now you're riding. And in MGS5, you're playing as Big Boss and Ground Zeroes. You, you have this good, like, hour or so of, like, getting familiar with, with Snake. You're getting familiar with it. And then, when you play the Phantom Pain, it's like, boom. Nine years later, oh, right, oh, yeah, Shrapnel. Oh, Miller is, is over here. Oh, your base is something different now. Oh, this and that. Like, they do all of this because you're already accustomed to, to what happened. You know, you're already there. You're already there in the, like... In your mind, uh, while in uh, in Less of Us Two, it, it was just kind of all over the place. You start off as Joel. You're going. You're talking to Tommy. Oh, okay, that's a good good way to start. Then you're switching to Ellie. Okay, you're Ellie now. All, all right, sweet. All right, now you're Abby. Okay, I'm Abby. Okay, now you're Ellie. O okay, okay, now you're Abby again. Oh, okay, and it just switches way too much where you don't get your your. Your bearings with it, and I honestly like I don't agree with people saying that oh Joel could have died at the end of the game or in the middle of the game. I think if he died in the middle, that'd be way too late for a revenge plot because that that'd be ridiculous for for a plot of revenge unless you're unless unless you're playing as Abby for like the first half or something. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't. I don't think the 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 story that they wanted to tell. I don't think it would have worked if he died halfway in. I think maybe a quarter or something. You know, give it. You have to build up to it. You have to earn that that kill. And the way I would have done it was maybe have an hour of you playing as Joel, doing some clearing out of the infected, gathering supplies. You know, all this stuff. Then within that hour, you might have like a flashback to the hospital, and you do that segment again, or or something. You know. You, you know, give the player more time to get his 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 uh, head on straight with these new characters and where they've been and you know the new camp that they're at. Like it goes by so so quickly, you don't really appreciate anything. And then when they kill Joel, it's like they ask you to care, and it's like I I just started the game and I don't know what's what. I I'm not appreciating anything just yet, and you already killed Joel, and it's like I I I think it was way too fast. And it just didn't give you enough time to set in, and I think if if they did if they just if they ju if they did not have you cut between three characters in the beginning, it would have been better. Like if the beginning was just focusing on one character, you could do it. And the thing is, like with Last of Us One, the story in Last of Us One is very typical for a zombie for a zombie mo a zombie movie, whatever. It's very like safe and. And generic, but allow the game to to to, to uh, flesh out these characters, allow these characters to shine, and uh, and to have you like see their their path, their and where they're going, all this stuff. Like like that's what a, a, a simple story allows you to do. Sometimes, like you already know where the story's gonna be, but you know if you already know that, you could kind of touch on this on the characters. Oh, we can like fine tune Joel to be this way, Ellie could be that way, you know, whatever. You could kind of fine-tune a lot of stuff with a generic plot like that. And Le and Les was too, it's like, yeah, a revenge plot's not anything not generic. I mean, a revenge plot's pretty generic, but it, it doesn't get it right with the pacing and the development of it, and it keeps jumping around characters where you're not, you're, you're not getting anything out of it. Like, you're not understanding it. It's like, it, it seemed way too convoluted with what it does with you jumping between characters, and it's like, with this, it would have benefited if it just kept it simple. Okay, you're Joel for, like, an hour, and then you get introduced to Abby, and then Abby and then Abby gets the upper hand on you, you get dragged into this room, and she starts playing golf with you. Uh, like, that, that would have been better because you would have understood Joel a little bit, you would have had some time with him, to do some combat and be like, oh yeah, oh man, he has to craft shivs, he has to do this, and then, like, it moves to Ellie when he gets, like, knocked out to be whatever, or he gets shot in the leg. He, that then transitions to Ellie trying to find Joel, because, you know, whatever. And it goes from there, and I, I, it would have benefited if it just kept it simple. They, they tried to do all this, like, shifting and changing, and, and anyone would tell you if, if, if you're directing a movie... If you if you keep jumping from character to character, the viewer isn't gonna care. Like, why should I care about 
Joel if we're going to switch to Ellie? Why would I care about Ellie right now if we're going to switch to Abby in like five minutes? Like, it jumped way too much and asked a lot from the viewer or from the gamer to kind of care. And it's like, this, this happened way too fast. Um, and the other thing is that they don't give you a clear motive for Abby up front. They, they don't even hint at it. And that's the other thing I, I, I mentioned earlier when I was playing this game way in the beginning is that when you play Ground Zeroes, the game gives you a vague motive for Skullface to go after Big Boss, to why Skullface wants to kill Big Boss. You know, they give you a vague mo a motive. Oh, Skullface hates Zero. Oh, okay, that's why he's, he, he wants to kill Big Boss, because Big Boss is like Zero's best friend, and Zero cares for Big Boss, and it makes sense, and there, there's that motive. You don't know necessarily the details why Skullface did it. Of course, I mean, you have to play MGS5, The Phantom Pain, to get that fully, supposedly, but you get that in that game, while Ground Zero gives you those little breadcrumbs to kind of think, to think about. In this, like, they, they he, she kills Joel, and they just kind of are like, yeah, fuck you, Joel, and it's like, okay, like, and, and, and the one line that Ellie has when you, when you switch to her to do day one of Seattle, she says, like, oh, yeah, Joel crossed so many people, there's no point in guessing, and it's, it's like, and that point, you're, you're like, yeah, is this just gonna be some random guy, that, random guy, random, random person killing Joel, like, is this just some random thing, and, and I, I was a little concerned that it would be something for something really whatever. Uh, but <clears throat> the game does explain Abby's motive for it. Now, now, of course, people, people wrote off Abby. They don't, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fair to say, like, yeah, I'm not going to care for the character that killed Joel. You know, I like Joel and she killed him. Why would I care? I, I get that, but, <clears throat> but I, I was willing to give Abby a, a chance when I was playing it. And I really do think that. She has a good motive for wanting Joel to die. Like, she has a good motive for revenge. Like, that's what I liked about, about Abby's campaign the most. That it felt a little bit tighter than Ellie's story. Uh, with Ellie's story... <clears throat> excuse me. Like, like my throat is, like, really dry. I have the fan on. It's probably putting dust in my mouth. So, hold on. I just don't want to be, like, sitting there, like, coughing all day, so. Mm. Sorry, I also have phlegm, so. I mean, gotta, gotta deal with me. I'm sorry. But, uh, so, like, that's the beginning. But it, was, it, it, was, it went by way too fast, all that kind of shit. With Ellie's story, I was fine with her wanting revenge because, yeah, she, she was with Joel for so long, you know, whatever. I was, like, kind of on board with Ellie at that point until... You get the flashbacks where Ellie starts to prod Joel and like, oh yeah, if only they had a, a, a cure, right, Joel? And he, he's just like, like a little concerned. And then like, El then in a later flashback, Ellie goes to the hospital that was in the first game and finds out that, you know, she was the only one that was inf that was immune. That all all that stuff. She found out that Joel was lying to her. Joel said that there were other people that were immune. That was not true. He said that to to kind of calm her down, which wasn't the case. He he told her he told her a lie, and I at that point I was really starting to question her motive for revenge. I, and and the, to clarify, I'm not saying that Ellie would be happy that Joel is dead. I'm not saying that either. But I don't know how much of an investment she would have with wanting to kill Abby because I feel like that. To a degree, Ellie understood why people would be mad at Joel, and to to get a little bit ahead of myself and talk about the ending, the ending does a terrible job trying to get have Ellie forgive Joel or or try to, which is like like that part was so like it was so dumb, and I'll get into more of why I think it's a little lame how they treated Ellie in this game. You know, a lot of people talk about how they assess, how they did a character assassination on Joel. I don't think that's the case at all because Joel was never meant to be a good person in the first game, and that's why a lot of people liked the ending of it because it left you saying to yourself, "Did he do the right thing? I mean, he took a, he took away the vaccine from a potential vaccine. You know, he he did this stuff. You know, you have that, and then you have like, well, 
he lost his daughter, you know, he, he, you know, this and that. Like, like you have this dichotomy with Joel, Joel's character where, you know, he, he, he's this ambiguous character. He doesn't, he's not a, um, <clears throat> a goody two-shoes. He's not like a Mr., he's not a heroic person. And, and this game, it was, it was, it kept, it felt like the game kept asking Ellie to be, to be best friends with him. And it's like, I, I, I think that kind of misses the point of his character in the first game to kind of, keep asking Ellie to forgive him, and it's like, I don't think that what he did is forgivable, and Ellie tells him straight up that she doesn't even know if he could forgive him, but she'll try, and I was like, no. I'm like, yeah, don't, like, Ellie doesn't have to kill Joel, I'm not saying that Ellie has to kill him or anything like that, but like, the, 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 the decision he made screwed over humanity. It, it, it was a bad decision in the, great, in the grander scheme of things. Like you can disagree or agree with him. I'm not saying that that it's a one-sided thing, but if if Ellie was invested in getting a cure and Joel prevented it, I can't really see her just sitting there be like, "Oh, I'm gonna try to forgive you." It's like it's like no, that's like that's against your your, your own character to to just be willing to forgive him for for that. Like, you could sit there and say, I'm not mad or whatever, but I think it's a little much to sit there and say, well, well I, I'm going to try to forgive you. And then go on this crusade to kill Abby for, for the decision that she, that she was even fucking, like, at odds with. So, uh, her whole motivation was so shaky and, and questionable that, like, I could not get behind Ellie, Ellie's revenge. Like, I, I feel like what, what, what would have worked better <clears throat> is if she didn't find out at all that Joel lied to her. She goes through this revenge plot, she goes through with it, and at the very end of the game, like, as, like, you know, Ellie's, like, you know, choking uh, or drowning Abby, Abby's, like, telling her, what, like, Tr like telling her that Joel lied to her, and and you know she has some like like proof, like she has a recording or something. Like, she has something to prove that Joel was lying to her, and and that would have worked so much better because at that point she would hear that and be like, "What the fuck?" And she she'd be conflicted. She'd have these this big conflict in her head, like, you know, what do what, what do I really know about Joel? What was he been keeping from me? All this stuff. He, she would start like processing it, and she would kind of be like, "Oh, oh fuck it, Abby. You know what?" Just, just go as she's trying to process the whole thing, and then and all that. That would have been that would have worked so much better for the whole game. It it would have given uh, Ellie a stronger motive to go after Abby to begin with if she didn't know that Joel lied to her about taking the cure off the table, that kind of stuff. Like like it, it would have worked infinitely better if she just never did that investigation in the flashback. Uh, it just hurt the motivation for Ellie even more. And that's why like I was saying like a lot of times on Twitter and my and my playthrough that Abby really had a better story in comparison because her motivation was, hey, Joel took took the cure off the table. Joel killed her dad. Joel killed a lot of the fireflies. Like these were all things that that could fuel a revenge plot. Like these are like typical ingredients. And it was all there. They had this character that was going through all this shit as well. Like, she, she gets her revenge on Joel. She goes off. She goes through all this shit with, with the Lev. She goes through all this shit with the WLF. She starts questioning the WLF. She starts saying, like, I don't know if, you know, you should really be sticking with this. That's why she, was, she goes out to talk to Owen before the WLF is sent out to kill Owen because she knows what the WLF will do, so she wants to... Listen to him. She she goes through all all this shit to get to that point, and then in her campaign she runs into Ellie's revenge crusade where she finds that Ellie killed she killed Owen she killed Mel, so that fuels Abby to get revenge again on on Ellie, and at that point like near the end like before Abby could kill Dinah. Uh, Dina, uh, Lev stops her because, like, she's pregnant, all this kind of stuff, like, Lev kind of says, hey, stop, and then Abby kind of drops it, and it's like, hey, I don't want to see you again, and then she moves on, and I'm, at, at that point, 
I'm, I, I'd be more willing to argue that Abby has a better reason to kind of stop going after her for revenge because she's been through so much shit. She's seen so much shit at that point. Like, she was going through the scars. She saw how the, she went through Lev's loss of a mother and a sister. She, she saw all this loss and hurt that I could see her sitting there like, oh, okay, this is, you know, I'm beyond this. I'm just going to move on. You know, fuck this, you know. She she had more of a reason to drop than Ellie, uh, than Ellie did. So then when you go back to playing as Ellie, and Ellie is like uh, living a normal life for a while, Tommy feeds into her revenge uh, thirst again, but it's like, oh my god, we went here and this this and that. And I was sitting there, I was like, uh, she got her, her ship beat out of. Like, Abby, like, won that fight. And I still feel like at that point, like, there's no reason for Ellie to continue or to go or to get revenge. And at that point, it honestly just felt like that Tommy was like, hey, you're a fucking hypocrite, bitch. Fuck you. And Ellie's like, he called me a hypocrite. I gotta do it now. And it's like, th th this is just kind of weird right now. And as I said, like, I think. You know, a lot of people complain about Abby's character and, and how she's not likable, but if you just look at the story, I mean, her story is flawed, too. You get to, you know, you can see that the whole story with with her relation with Lev is kind of generic. It's typical, like, okay, this character, you know, feels something for a character that's going through some persecution, whatever. And it's like, oh, yeah, it, it's it's generic and safe, but it's, it's like I said about the first game. You have a generic plot allows you to have these rich characters. You get to develop them more because you have a, a safe plot to kind of fall on. And Abby's campaign, for the most part, has been a safe campaign. It's it's very generic and typical, but it allowed it allowed the game to kind of further the bond with Lev and Abby and gives you this kind of like, yeah, I, I, I could see. I could see a lot of this stuff going on with that. You know, and there's some with Abby that's kind of, kind of sloppy. Like, you know, even though I, I did say, like, Abby won that, you know, had, had the most to leave with, like, she could leave that revenge and not kill Dina at the same time. Like, yeah, I could see that. I could see Abby doing that. I, I could also see Abby just killing Dina and not caring what Lev wanted because, you know, Abby at that point is a soldier. She did all this bad shit in the past and she's going to be held back now. Like, you know, it, it, it it's this weird dual-edged sword with that particular scene where it's like, I could see it go both ways, so, so, eh. I mean, it's, it's whatever, but I feel like that Abby probably should have at least done something to Ellie to kind of make sure she knows, hey, don't fuck with me, like, maybe he's, like, stab her femur or something, or, like, you know, like, in, in Batman Beyond Return of Joker, that movie where Joker stabs Batman in, like, the leg, and it causes him to limp? And that's why he has like the the cane in the in the Batman Beyond series. Like he has the cane because of Joker. Uh, like if if Abby did that to Ellie, it it would have been fine. It would have been like, oh shit, she left her mark and all this kind of stuff. And that and that was mostly at the end with the uh, her missing her her last two fingers. Uh, so like that is my overall issue with the story is that I think the flashbacks for Ellie's side of the campaign seemed very pointless and. The ones that seemed important belittled the revenge plot. Like, the, the flashbacks actively damaged Ellie's motive. Actively. While Abby's flashbacks, some of them were just dream sequences, but hers at least explained why she was on this revenge plot to begin with, why she was after Joel, and all this stuff. It gave you answers. Ellie, Ellie's flashbacks, honestly hurt the hurt her story more than it helped. So I, I, I don't really think it was a, a, a solid story for Ellie as it was for Abby. <clears throat> so I mean that that's my opinion on the story. I, I think overall the story is very weak and it kinda hurts the game altogether. Like as I was playing it it was sitting between a six and a seven out of ten because <clears throat> I really liked the, the uh, gameplay, and when I was playing it, the Abby stuff was really good, and I really liked it, and it was like, yeah, I can see this being a 7, because the Abby stuff was really, really strong. 
but then but then the ending happened and that that drove it down uh so uh ellie saves abby because she was like being hung or whatever because you know whatever reason she tried to escape or whatever so they, they put her in this area where they kind of leave you out to starve to death whatever uh and Abby and Ellie are fighting. You know, Abby was willing to say, just go, you know, whatever. And Ellie was like, no, you're fighting me and all this kind of stuff. She forces the fight. Uh, Abby wins again. Uh, because Ellie kind of gave up the fight at that point. Like, she was just, like, kind of... Like, she, as she was drowning Abby, she was thinking... She was having flashbacks to Joel. And that kind of, like, was like, okay, you know, I give up. And I assume what it was trying to communicate was that... Ellie tr remembered that, yeah, Joel killed her dad. Oh, Joel removed the cure from the world. Like, she, he prevented there to be a cure. Okay, and all that. But it just didn't work out for me. Like, it just, it just wasn't clear. And I, I just think that, as I said, like, that flashback just did more harm to her story. As I said, I think what would have worked better... For that ending to work, like I did, like the emotion of that end of that ending. I like that she was like she started crying a little bit. Like, it was just like sitting there in in like the shallow end of the of the beach as as Abby and Lev go off. That she's just like very destroyed and broken from that. I like the energy of that scene, the the emotion and all that is just it's it's cheapened by her willing to forgive Joel for. Uh, for this, like, it, it was just lame, and, and the issue I had with Ellie a lot in this game is that they, they made her so dependent on Joel, and it's like, you know, and, and, and I don't want to sound like one of these people that, 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 that care about these, this fluff article, that like, oh man, we're very progressive and this and that, but how can you say that you have a strong strong characters and all this stuff when you have Ellie so dependent on Joel like Joel took the cure off the table and you could agree or disagree but Ellie did not even come to that conclusion like it you know and, and when it happened I was saying to myself are they going to resolve this conflict are they going to are they going to address it and they don't they don't address it because it ends with Ellie being like well I don't forgive you, but I'm gonna try. And it's like you're you're gonna you're gonna try. And, and and it's like this is something that like you went across the country for. Like Ellie was gung ho for it. Joel like had more reason to to, to kind of stop the the cure from being made because he 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 was a broken person. He missed his daughter and. He had all this stuff going on that that ex that explained why Joel did what he did. That's what made him like such a very like divisive character, where it's like you either be for what Joel did or against. Two just doesn't give you this ambiguity with anything, and it kind of forces you to kind of see Joel in one way. It forces you to sit to see him as like this. Oh, Joel was a father, and Joel and. Joel loved Ellie, and Ellie, you know, she was just an angry teen. It's like, the, the thing that Joel did wasn't like, oh, it was a dumb fight or something, you know, it wasn't anything like that. It was like, hey, he actually prevented a cure from being made. And, and it, it's a big deal for Ellie that that happened. And, and the game kind of glosses over that, just ignores that, that side of her, and it's like, no, no, yeah, you have to forgive Joel. You, you have to. It's like, it, it, it's it's like the parent that buys that stupid t-shirt that forces the siblings to be under the same shirt and says, oh, this is the get along shirt or whatever. And it's like, you're doing that with Joel and Ellie. It's like, it, it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't because the thing he did was, it was, a, was a big issue. It was a big deal because it had, it had repercussions. Like, when I played the first game, I sat there, I was like, yeah, this is going to have repercussions. I mean, I could see someone being mad about this. And Abby being that consequence made sense. That's why I was like, y you know, a lot, I, I felt to a point, uh, a lot of people were just being, it was, was just reactionary towards, towards Abby. Like, oh, she killed Joel, oh my god. And it's like, 
you, you have to understand that, like, he killed her dad. He prevented there to be a cure to be made. I mean, th these are decisions that could piss people off. Now, of course, with, with oh, well, Joel killed so many people. I mean, and so did Ellie. Uh, they could have children that could seek revenge. And it's like that, of course. <laughs> like, like, of course that's always what's going to happen. The thing is that, like, to try to give Ellie this, like, bloodthirst, like, oh, she doesn't give a fuck who she kills, as long as she kills Abby. She doesn't care about that. And, like, to have this, this theme of, oh, this character is gonna, is gonna drop revenge and move on from it, you need to have something that's gonna make her stunned or, or have her process shit. And, what better way than to unveil at that point when you're about to kill Abby that Joel lied to you? Because at that point, it flips. It flips everything in it. Like, it would have worked so much better. And it, it, it's it's frustrating that they just didn't do it. It it was the biggest gimme for, for it. Like, it, it just blows my mind that they didn't go for it. Like... It, 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 it would have encompassed everything. Like, y you have this motive. You and Ellie have this motive against Abby. You can understand why Abby did it, sure. Okay. But, like, oh, shit. Ellie really cares about Joel, and, he, and she killed him. She killed him, dude. And she doesn't know why. She's like, what the fuck? She goes, she goes after Abby. And Abby's like, what did Joel tell you uh, about when he saved you or whatever? And she's like, and there are more of us. Why did, he, why did he kill Joel when there's other people who are immune? Whatever. And, and Abby's like, do you think he was telling you the truth? He was lying. Whatever. And that could have just been like, bam. You know, that something like that would have worked. But instead, they, they do this, like, it honestly feels like Last of Us 2 is one big uphill fight. Because the game asks so much. So much from the viewer, from the gamer, from the person to, to put into it that it's like it's insane what it's asking. Like, you can't ask for, for a person who loved the first game to care about Abby because Abby killed Joel. You, you can't, you, you're, that's already an uphill fight. So that's like strike one for it. Then strike two is like, now you're asking the, the, the person to be okay with Ellie going after Abby even though Ellie's upset that Joel lied to her. Oh, okay. And then asks you again to be, like, forgiving of Joel. And it's like, what the fuck are you doing? There's all these things that don't mesh and they, and they, con and they contradict each other. Like, it's, it blows my mind that, that this is what the game is asking of the viewer. It's like, this is way too much to ask. Like, you know, people thought that MGS4 asking the viewer to be okay with nanomachines explaining away every single thing that MGS2 introduced... That, that was a big ask, but it, now it, that seems like, you know, whatever. This is, like, asking so much, and it belittles everything that two, that one did. Because you have this ambiguity with Joel where people within the fan base was debating, did is what Joel did right? And people have been saying, oh, yeah, he did what he did was right. Other people said that the what he did was fucked up. Whatever, you have this discussion in one that allowed people to be like, yeah, man, in this, it's like, there's the game does not introduce anything that seems remotely open to, to talk about. It's like it doesn't want you to talk about it, and it just says and just accept and asks for acceptance. And it's like, no, no, you this stuff makes no sense even with the character motives. Like Abby is the only character that has a, a strong motivation. That's the only character in the game. Where the motivations are strong. Same with Dinah. Like, the the relationship between Dinah and and Ellie was well done. I, 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 did, I didn't have an, an issue with that. I thought that was like a cool little dynamic there. I liked that even how dumb it was for, for Ellie to want to get, get revenge again. That, like, I did like where, where Dinah was like, Dude, dude. You, you promise not do this again. You know we're we're we're, we're happy now. You know you're not happy with this, and 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 when Abby when Abby whoops when Ellie leaves, Dina kind of is like fuck it and leaves. And I'm just saying it's like, that's what you do. Like 
Dina has more of a of of integrity to up and leave Ellie because she was not she did not agree with what Ellie decided, so she up and left. Uh I mean, obviously Dina's not gonna be like, yeah, I hope Ellie dies, fuck her. But you know, what Ellie did for Dina was was unacceptable and you know, she might try to forgive her or whatever, but she's but it's it's a big deal to her, so she leaves and, and it's it's a big thing. Uh, well, Ellie has no integrity. There's no integrity with anything she believes. She believed in giving, getting that, that cure from the fireflies. Joel prevents that from happening. She then is like, oh, maybe I'll try to forgive you. And it's like, do you have any integrity with what you what you fought for in the first game? And, it, and it's just such bad writing. Because it, you, it, 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 it blows my... It, it, like it's frustrating that they had they had this big potential for a good message and a good like thing to end on and it's fumbled by these flashbacks by her knowing that Joel lied to her is just it's it's madness it's madness what they what they expect from the viewer to say and it's just it is maddening uh so that really bumped it down to a 6 honestly the abby stuff the abby campaign was really strong for me to love it, to, to get through it. I really liked Abby's campaign. I really liked her story. Her story was really interesting with the stuff with the Scars, the WLF, Lev and Yara, that kind of shit. All that shit was all interesting, how that encompassed everything. The Ellie stuff was so sloppy, and it was just like, what are you doing with these characters? Like, again, as I said, I, I, I'm not against... Joel dying in the game, or like in, in, in the beginning, or whatever. I mean, you could do that. It's just that the beginning kept jumping between characters, and you're just getting your bearings within this game that, you know, had years apart. And by the time you get your bearings, it's like, okay, let's kill Joel. And then you're just like, oh, wait, wait. Like, it just doesn't do a good job building up to that major scene. So yeah, that bumps it down to a 6 out of 10. I would honestly tell you guys, if you are even remotely interested in playing this game, wait for a sale. The only reason why I got it uh, at launch was because I had uh, Best Buy reward money saved up. Uh, you know, I have, the, I, have my, I have the My Best Buy Club shit, and I had enough points to save up to at least make the, uh, the price of the game, like, you know, $40, and I, I was willing to, to fork over 40 for... For um, what for the for this game, uh, so that's why it's six out of ten for me. Uh, I can't recommend it at sixty dollars. That's just out there. Uh, the other thing is that there's no multiplayer, which is fucking lame. I thought I thought that they said that they were gonna do it later. Like, oh yeah, we're not doing factions day one. It's coming. It's coming later. I thought they were gonna do something later with that, uh, but it seems like that they canceled it altogether, which is. Really sad because I loved the multiplayer in the first game. It was really fun and and interesting. It kind of it kind of had good co-op uh, vibes in it. And for them to not do it in two is like really so that was that was a bummer uh, for the most part. But whatever. Overall, it, it's it, it's it's a it's an average game. It's it's kind of bland. It, it fumbles a lot of the characters from the first game. Uh, the revenge story is not that tight for Ellie, at least. It, it, it's it's a mess. So, yeah, it's a six out of ten. So, I'll let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Uh, I'll I'll keep it. I'll keep an eye out for for the comment section. But that was my opinion. I hope I hope it made sense. I hope uh, you see where I'm coming from with it. Uh, I do like the music. I think the music is really good. The music is just, it was so, so fucking awesome. Uh, like the parts where you're going through the human AI stuff, and here's your dun 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 dun. It was like really cool, like beat to it. And I did like the art of it. You know, a lot of people complain about the character design. I, I don't find an issue with the character design. As far as Ellie, Abby, I'm, I'm mixed on. It's like, I, I could see, you know, maybe she's too buff, whatever, you know. It wasn't a big deal for me, but I, I could see I, I I'm mixed on it as I said, but I I overall I overall like the 
art direction with the environments. I like uh, some of the character designs that were there. So that's that's my two cents. So thanks for watching this very long on spot review. I'll try to do another one. Uh, I think I, I I have a I have one that I want to do after I finish one particular show. I'm watching the show right now, and it's it's something. I'm, I'm so you look forward to that coming coming into the future. So see you guys next time. Thank you for watching this little video. Hope to see you in the next one. And guys, stay safe and stay healthy. Oh. By the way, by the way, guys, I should say this last little bit of announcement here. I have new of a new thing on my Gumroad store. I have I I have a merch store, Gumroad store, whatever you want to call it. You check it out. It'll be in the description below somewhere. I have released a rough sketch collection. The rough sketch collection has artwork that sketches that uh, have either been patron exclusive or you know stuff that I've not made publicly. And all of the thumbnails to videos that I've put out recently. So you can check that out. It's $5. Uh, so feel free to check that out. There's other stuff on that government store as well that is up there. But that's the newest stuff I put out. I'll be putting up, I'll try to be putting up more rough sketch collections in the future. But that's the one I have right now. It's $5. You get like a collection of artworks and thumbnails that I've done. Uh, but. Uh, you know, other than that, thank you guys for watching, and, uh, everyone just, as I said before, stay safe, stay healthy, you know, it's, it's wild out there, and, you know, I, do what you must, you know, I, who knows what's gonna happen, stay, stay good, everyone, and, uh, I'll see ya, see you next time.